Now, isn't it apt that we're doing this during COVID? You know, in the COVID lockdown places, if you're trying to move from one place to another, the security people usually ask you four questions. Who are you? Why are you here? Where have you come from? And where do you want to go? So actually, in this DTS, we had already answered the questions. We said, who are you? So Ali, on day one, she discussed our identity. And why are you here? But Jonah talked about calling and purpose. And then where are you from? Where are you from? This morning, Justin says, I come from a place where I thought I was the king. And where are we going? We're going to the place where our Abba Father is the king. And Pastor Epson said, that is our home, a place where our heart can call a home. So then what about this talk? This talk is about how are we going to get there? So isn't that the million dollar question? Now, I cannot preach because my background, I'm only a lawyer. So <laughs> I'm, not an, I'm not a preacher like the other ones. So all I can do is to share with you um, how I feel about the, uh, the topic and my experiences. Okay, so bear with me. All right, so I think it's important for us just to review the basic principles first. Let's build our foundation well and strong because um, I'm aware that this DTS has actually attracted people from different uh, quarters, different places in their faith journey, and uh, even physical places. Um, the gentleman from Dubai, I salute you, and uh, from India, yes. So the first thing that we have to be aware of is, of course, Jesus explained to us, God is spirit. Yes, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, that is something which very basic and most Christians have already been aware of. But let's hold that in mind about why we must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what does it actually mean? So uh, in 2 Corinthians, it teaches us that we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Now, that seems, you know, to be a primary uh, 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 or Sunday school kit thing. But in Hong Kong, where people are so materialistic, where society concentrates on looking at, you know, the clothes you wear, uh, what, what sort of a job you have, and, uh, you know, where, where, where is your office, then this kind of teaching can be a little bit challenging if we really try to think about it. Because whatever we see, is not going to be there forever. And that includes in Hong Kong, and I think for your generation, the real challenge now is that we see so many injustices, so many things that are happening in Hong Kong that we never thought would be seeing. But it's good to remind ourselves is what we see is only temporary, and what is unseen is the eternal bit. Now, then, then what, is, what is our human makeup? For our human beings, and this I introduce, can I introduce, uh, can, you, can you see my friend Charlie? Yeah. Okay, now, in the Bible, it teaches us that we have a spirit, soul, and body. Okay, now, so, our dear friend here, apart from his not having a mouth, pretend that he's human, so he has a body, okay? And he also has a soul. So when the Bible talks about a soul, it is slightly different from what we Cantonese or Chinese call a Ling Wan. When the Bible refers to a soul, it actually means the mind, which has thoughts, and also the heart, which has emotions and our conscience. And then, very important for the Bible, it's our will. Because we all know that God gave us free will. And what is will? Will is our determination, our desires, our wish 
do certain things. That is the will that the Bible talks about. And all those belong to the soul. So in some forms of the Bible, we would see the word soulish. Or in devotions, we would see that word. When we see that word, it is used to contrast with the spirit. Now, the spirit is not something physical. The spirit is like, I mean, in my old school thinking, it's like an antenna where you receive all the transmissions from the radio. Okay? So the spirit inside of us, there is something which resides in us. This is our instrument for communicating with the spirit of God. Now, let's bear that in mind, because if we get our basic definitions correct, uh, and as I said, I'm a lawyer, we make sure that we, we get the, the basics correct. Now, so what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit, first of all, is a helper, which is given to us by God. And so Jesus, before he was uh, taken away, he actually taught his disciples about the Holy Spirit. And he says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask, I cannot actually see this. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Now, first of all, we know then that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. And when Jesus talks about another advocate, it must assume that there must be a first advocate. The Holy Spirit is just the second one. So who is the first advocate? Anybody? It's Jesus, of course. <laughs> Jesus. What is an advocate? An advocate, when we talk about it in law terms, is your lawyer. He is the one who actually defends you and he puts forward your best case. He is your protector. And because he knows the rules and everything so well, he's the expert, he is able to guide you and to protect you and to bring you to the best position that you have. And this particular advocate will help you and be with you forever. Isn't that, isn't that cool? And the spirit of truth, and that, that is the Holy Spirit. Now, very important to remember is that the Holy Spirit indwells. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. And that is, isn't that about the world, particularly in Hong Kong society? Oh, you, you can't see God, you can't see it. You know, they, they're not going to believe that. So it's, a, it's a very challenging. But then we as Christians, we know him, for he lives with us and will be in us. So the Holy Spirit is not only somebody who walks beside us, with us. He is something, someone who is inside me. Okay? Now, I, I thought about this. How come that the Holy Spirit can be outside of me and inside of me? And I thought about this. If you take a Coca-Cola glass bottle and you fill it up with water, then the water is inside the bottle. And if you put the whole bottle with water inside your bathtub, the water is outside of the bottle, but it's also inside the bottle. So I think that would make a lot of sense about that. That is how the whole world is filled with the Holy Spirit and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's nothing contradictory between the two terms. Now, the Holy Spirit teaches us and reminds us. So this says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So Father God is sending Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit will testify about Jesus. He points to Jesus. But Holy Spirit will teach us all things and also remind us of everything that Jesus has said to us. Now, if you think about having a private tutor, who will always be inside you to remind you as to what you had learned. Isn't that fantastic? And so he is forever with us. So he is our life coach. He coaches us. 
on what to do. And one very important thing that he does is that he helps us to pray. Now, the Bible actually says we do not know what we ought to pray for. Actually, we do not know. We know what we want. And usually we come to God and we say, this is what I want. This is my problem. Okay. But then the Holy Spirit himself will intercede for us. Intercession means acting between the two persons and bringing them together. Uh, but the Holy Spirit doesn't just say blah, 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 gobble, gobble. He talks with groans that words cannot express. It is so deep that sometimes you actually feel it like a groan. Sometimes if you live with the Spirit for a longer time, I actually feel it in my tummy. It's a, it's a power and it's a warmth. You will heat up in the tummy and then you feel that this is the Spirit. It is groaning. It is telling me the direction for which I should be praying. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit, spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The Spirit will align our spirit with God's will so that, for example, uh, we all know about Billy Graham, the evangelist. His wife, Ruth, said, I am so pleased that God does not answer every prayer. Otherwise, I would have married the wrong man several times. <laughs> so the Spirit teaches us how to pray in accordance with God's will. And what about this? Holy Spirit is power. Amen. Jesus promised, saying that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, so we all know about the story of, on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit just came down powerfully onto the people who are waiting in accordance with how Jesus instructed them. And this is the power that the Holy Spirit gives us. And because the Holy Spirit lives inside us, we get this power too. And because the Spirit inside of us will testify that we are sons of God. So it says, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, isn't that a privileged position that the creator of the universe is actually our Abba, Father? Now, sometimes it's easier for us to intellectually understand something but it's more difficult for us to really accept it inside and really feel it. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It will give us that feeling that the, uh, a Mandarin speaker said, It's as if your heart is now resting on a rock and you know, you know definitely that you are the son of God. And I will be talking a little bit more about the experience uh, in part two, okay? Now, so to summarize, the Holy Spirit actually works in our spirit. It's this Holy Spirit who lives in us, who works in our spirit, so they're in partnership, so that we will see God's way. We see what things from a new perspective, and we can also feel his love and compassion, because it's so important that we get God's ideas. Our own ideas are too small. And it's so wonderful and so necessary to be able to feel God's heart, to know how he feels about certain things. And I know that in this era, since in the last, what, how many years, five years, many Hong Kong young people have been asking, God, where is your heart about our city? Are you seeing what's happening? How do you feel about it? And um, so the Holy Spirit gives us power and the strength to act. And it's so important to remember that we rely on his strength and not on ours. Mm -hmm. Now that's easier said than done. And um, in part two, I'm gonna help you to open yourself more to receiving his power. 
And the Spirit assures us of our identity as God's children. And because we know that our Father is actually that powerful, magnificent, wonderful creator of the heavens and of the earth, we feel so secure, right? Nothing can move us. If God is for us, who can be against us, right? So it's this sense of security that we really acquire. And that was what Ali was talking about in our identity, which is so important, that once we realize that, then it actually changes us. It gives us a strength and a confidence to walk this earth without fear. Now, but we have to be sensitive because the spirit does not shout at us. The spirit does not slap us and say, hey, hey, hey you know. The spirit does not oppress us. <laughs> Sometimes it does feel a little bit that way, <laughs> but actually, no. <laughs> the spirit is gentle. The spirit will not force itself onto us. It allows us to come to our own conclusion, but it will gently nudge and guide us. But it is so important for us to be able to respond to the spirit and act on his guidance. Now, being able to hear the spirit is therefore one very important thing. Now, but in our lives, there are actually obstructions to our hearing the spirit. And um, I've uh, tried to um, make it into a sort of a barrier for you to look at, and I hope you can see the words. Now, the big one, of course, are our sins. Whatever sins which have not been confessed means that they have not yet been forgiven by God. So we have to look in our hearts to wonder, to ponder, what are the sins that we have committed? That things that sometimes we think, oh, it's so long ago. It's uh, been so long ago. God would have forgotten about it. I have forgotten about it. And many times we have rooms, if, if our life was a, was a flat, you know, which is Hong Kong people likes to think about having a property. Do we have a little room, a little dark room where we ourselves don't even enter and our guests never get to enter? And this is the kind of obstructions that if they exist in our lives, we want to be able to get rid of them this, this afternoon. Unforgiveness. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught, that we, the Father forgives us as we forgive others. And forgiveness is a very big lesson because it's really not in our human nature to forgive. Because we, when, when we feel that something has been so unjust, it's very difficult to forgive someone. Instead of forgiving, we want to justify ourselves. We want to, we want to uh, revenge. But God says, he is the one who will avenge, and it's not us. So being able to forgive is a difficult lesson, but it can be done, and it's a journey. So the important thing, actually, is to surrender it to God and say, God, I want to forgive, but I still cannot feel the forgiveness inside me. Can you please help? I will take one step. Please take the other 99 steps from you. And God does respond. God does help us. Then the gray one is the guilt. The guilt is the gray one because that is really so dark. Sometimes we have done bad things. Oh, okay. All right. Sometimes we have done bad things. We feel ashamed. We feel that we have not done what we expected ourselves to do. And so we feel difficult. And the anger will come, you know, if maybe we're angry with ourselves, we're angry with the world. And uh, pride is natural, we all understand that. Bitterness, willful stubbornness, we all know. Envy and jealousy, telling lies, malice. Wrong mindset, I'll talk about that in the second half. Now, what we do now is, uh, Sandra announced that uh, I asked for a piece of paper uh, from all of you. What I would like is to ask you to write down now for yourselves, write down of this drawing of the obstructions, whether you yourself 
have any. Okay? Now, be honest with yourself and be honest with God. Uh, let's have two minutes. If you need a reminder as to what they are, the, the, the slide is still there. You don't need to show it to anybody. Not even your boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband or wife. Just write it for yourself and for God. You, you don't need to quote the Bible at yourself. All you need to really do is to think, is there something in your own life which comes within these colored blocks, these obstructions, and just write them down? Because later on, we're going to destroy them. We're going to ask God to help us to destroy all of those obstructions and to free us. Ten more seconds. Okay. All right. Now, you will still have time during your small group discussion to further, if you want time during that discussion, just tell your leader that you want a little bit of quiet time for yourself. But now what I'm going to do is to pray for you and with you. Okay? So let's close our eyes. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Father God, thank you. Thank you that you are a wonderful Father. Thank you that after Jesus' resurrection, you sent us the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. Lord, I pray that you will now activate the Holy Spirit within everybody's belly. I call it the belly, which is a place where God knows where the Spirit resides in us. I just pray that you will activate their spirit. And Lord, we come to you with our brokenness. We confess that we have been prideful, been sinful, been unforgiving. And even though we may know the right answer because of our willful stubbornness, we have refused to follow the right one. Lord, please Please forgive all our dishonesty with ourselves and with others. Forgive us, Lord, when we have done wrong. We come to you and we ask God for that precious gift of your forgiveness, of your grace and mercy. So, Lord, we lift up as a package everything that we have done wrong, things that you have brought to our mind, things that you will bring to our mind, and things which we can't even fathom what it is. But we bring you the whole package and we lay it down on the foot of the cross. And Lord, we ask that you forgive us and you help us in the name of Lord Jesus Christ to break down these barriers, break down these obstructions so that they will have no further influence, no further effect in any of our lives 
in the lives of the participants, of the organizers, of the people who are listening over on Zoom, and of anybody who will in future listen to this tape. Lord, we pray and proclaim that, Lord, you demolish all these strongholds in our lives, that you are able to brick, brick all these so that you will set us free. Father God, we thank you for this privilege. And we now proclaim in the name of Jesus Christ that all of us have been set free by the Holy Spirit, that we are now freed from every bondage, every kind of obstruction which blocks us from hearing God and the nudgings of the Holy Spirit. We claim your victory, Lord. In the precious name of Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hope you're all back. So have you done your list over your, just now the extra time in the group discussion? So may I suggest that we now do a simple act. Let's tear it up. Let's tear it up and give it to God. Oh yeah, one, two, three, okay? Hold your piece of paper and say, we tear this up and we proclaim that God has freed us Amen. from all those obstructions. Yes, we give them all back to Jesus and Jesus will deal with them. And we're now free. So this afternoon, we're all freed and your ears have been unblocked, your hearts and spirits unblocked to listen to the rest of the talk. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Father God, we thank you for this opportunity of being together. Lord, you are the God who can do all the impossible things and you love us so much that you want to bless us. So we proclaim that everyone has now been freed from all the bondages and the obstructions which may have blocked us from hearing you. So Lord, as we go further into this topic, Please clear all our hearts, our minds, our spirit, our ears, so that we can really receive what you have for each one of us. And we know that we may not take away the same thing because we're all made uniquely by you. But Lord, we know that you have a good message and you have a good blessing for each one of us who is tuning in to listen to this. So we rely on you, Holy Spirit, and all glory goes to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, without further ado, let's launch into what does walking with the Spirit require? Basically, I mean, this, this is my, my own uh, uh, interpretation. First, you need to have a knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is we understand His Word, we have to know His Word, and through His Word, we know about his character. And when we know his character, actually, it rubs off a bit on us. Because when we know what our Father God is like, and we are people made in his image, so it will actually help us to grow from inside towards being like Christ. And secondly, we have to have a good relationship with God. So it is important that we have an intimate relationship with God and the other speakers have dealt with that. So I'm, I'm only going to gloss over that later on. And the third thing is we must have a knowledge of the enemy. Now, uh, this church has been dealing with uh, the full armor of God and Ephesians in pretty deep way. Uh, but when I come to that, I'll just gloss it over. And number four, that is the most important point because when I was preparing for this talk, I asked God, I said, Father, there's so much to talk about this topic, walking with the Spirit. What exactly is the message that you have for this generation? And God said, teach them to take authority. And I will deal with that later on, okay? So, yeah. can somebody help? It's not moving. Yeah, I'm pressing all buttons. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, I won't be able to read that. Anyway, <laughs> you can read it. You, you have young eyes, so you can read that Bible verse. Now, what I, what I intend to do is to invite you all, let's read out certain verses in Psalm 103. I'm quoting it just because it's my favorite psalm. We should be equipping ourselves to be able to walk with the Spirit. Now, when I say one, two, three, can we all read it out together? Because I sense that God is saying, gone is the day when you just sit and listen. Now is the time for action. So let's build our faith. Let's read this out loud together. Uh, unless you're in Starbucks, then you, you do it in, in your heart. Okay? One, two, three. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. Now, isn't that wonderful? Now, there are further Bible verses, but because um, we, we have so much to talk about, I'm not going to uh, read it all out together. If you want the Bible verses, please ask the organizers and they will send it to you. And it's a way that we build up our spirit, build up our strength in the spirit, when we, when we can read and really savor the descriptions of what our God is like. It gives us this strength in us and this understanding. So I now go into the second one, relationship with God. The important thing when we have a relationship is to have a pure heart. We should not be coming to God with an agenda. Now, so often, we come to God because we, are, we have problems, and then we come to him. And we have so many agenda of our own that we want God to hear us. Now, the secret about listening to God is actually when we say, God, I want to listen to you. I'm opening up myself to you. Can you talk to me? Can you let me know what you want me to know and what you are like? I just want to know you. And so... The verses there talks about, let's look at verse four. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So when we come to God, we hope that our hands are clean. We have not done, done anything wrong. And we have, if our hands are not clean, we ask him to clean it for us. And we come to him with a pure heart, not wanting to control or manipulate God. And God says he listens to the one who do not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. So we understand that God hates anything which is false. No lies. And the important bit is about the submission. These verses talk about show his way to us. So that is the way that we need to submit to God. And... Uh, God waits for us to take one step before he will actually show us the next one. Now, this is often a very difficult part for us because we like to listen to God. We like to know what he thinks, but then we want to reserve the right not to listen to him and not to follow how he guides us. And the important thing is this. Sometimes I hear Christians saying that, how come I can't hear God? And it's because when God tells us step one, if we don't take it, he's not going to tell us about step two because it takes your, a process. And until that happens, <laughs> I cannot, sorry. 
Okay, so the intimacy is when my heart says, seek his face. So how often do we actually seek God's hands? We want his favor. We want to ask God to do certain things for us. But the important thing is to seek his face and not his hands. And wow, this is the verse, Psalm 25, verse 14. I've got to read this aloud. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. When I first encountered this verse, I was really blown away by these words. Can you imagine the creator of the heavens and the earth confiding in us, telling us what he thinks, telling us his secrets? Have you ever asked God, Lord, what are your prayer requests for today? Maybe that would be a good habit to form. And I want, I want to share with you um, an experience that I had when I was a new Christian. I emphasize that was when I was a very new Christian. So um, bear with me. So I attended my mother's church. And one, one Sunday morning, I was upstairs in the gallery, and which overlooks the whole church. And it was my aunt's turn to pray for the offering. And it was a cha traditional Chinese church, so everything was very formal. She took very formal steps up the altar, held the uh, thing up, and then she started to pray. It was the first time I've ever heard my aunt pray in public. And when she prayed, she has a very low voice like I did, but she raised it like very high, like Cantonese opera. And she was saying, Ting, I get painful. And people started giggling. And I felt so embarrassed. I was, I was like, God, God, don't let anybody know she's my aunt. <laughs> Does it have to be so excessive and melodramatic? Yes. And instantly, instantly, there was a blinding white light. I opened my eyes and then I saw the rafters of the church. It was in joy. It was not as if it was dangerous. It was... It felt like it was a big, fat, roly-poly grandfather chuckling. And I felt that that was his wink at me to say, yeah. And I sense he said, yeah, it's a bit over the top, but she means well. And that moment, I just felt electrified. Can you imagine the creator of the heavens and the earth sharing a joke with me? And it was, and then I just felt a sense of humor and a sense of love. And I felt I'm his favorite daughter, that, that he loves me so much that he will share his confidences with me. He knows how I think. And he says, yeah, but you know, she means well. <laughs> At the same time, I saw that my aunt was his favorite daughter too. It was as if he had his protective hand around her and saying, yeah, so she messed up a little bit. You know, it was a little bit overdramatic and a bit embarrassing, but she meant well. She's because in her excessive enthusiasm to please me, she ended up, you know, making a tiny little fool of herself. But it's OK because she's she's got her heart in the right place. So it taught me. That, that night, I went back and, and wrote my journal. I said, I'm a changed woman from then. Because what I realized was God loves me so much to validate my feelings. And he did not judge me according to my feelings. He was so gentle with me, but I was convicted. I realized by how God reacted that he was a God who has this big heart who accepts us for who we are. And even though we may mess up things a little bit, or even a big bit, he still loves us. And he would pr put his protective arm around my aunt. And I understood then what the advocate actually means, is he's the person who protects us when we do wrong or when we are attacked by other people, when we are laughed at by others because we did something which is not cool, like bringing an old school <laughs> uh, a little doll. Even if it's not cool, even if it doesn't, it's not fashionable, 
even if it's something out of the ordinary, it, God is not surprised. He still accepts us because he knows us for who we are. Man looks at the outside, but God really looks at the heart. And so I, it gave me the confidence from then on to know that it really doesn't matter very much about how other people think about me. What matters is that God still loves me that much. And if I am attacked, God will actually be my advocate. He will defend me just as I saw his big fat arm around my aunt and saying, she means well, you know, don't laugh at her. He's that protective God. And it gave me the confidence from then on to be myself, to grow my white hair without dying. <laughs> and, and just to, to know that I'm so well loved by my father God, that even if I mess up, he will come to my rescue. And it's just like Jesus with the woman whom they were going to stone. Jesus did not condone adultery. He did not say that that was right, but he was protective of the woman. He protected her from further attacks by the people and further shame. And it's giving us back our dignity, just as what we read just now. He gives us, he redeems us from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion. He crowns us, giving a crown on our head, giving us that dignity to appear before people. And those who love God will never be put to shame. And he is the one who gives us that kind of uh, protection and love. And he's the advocate for us. God never rebuked me for being critical. Because when I wrote in my journal, I said, then I realized I was so intolerant, so critical, and uh, so judgmental, and particularly towards one's own family. I think we tend to be even more harsh in our judgment. If God had said, Stephanie, you shouldn't be so uh, intolerant, I think I would have defended myself and argued with him and say, I wasn't intolerant, etc. But because <laughs> I'm hearing the echo of my voice, sorry. <laughs> but because he didn't, he didn't. He just used his Holy Spirit to gently convict me. And the Bible says is it's actually the kindness of God which convicts us. And so I was able to reflect in my own time, just as I hope just now in the small group or your quiet time, you were able to reflect and come up with a conviction to know that, yeah, I was wrong. And, but it is the knowledge of how God is, of his nature, and of how loving and how tolerant, how accepting he is of all of us, that actually changed my heart. So that's why I, I want to use this as an example to show why a knowledge of God and knowing the word will actually bring him alive for us. And when we encounter God in a real life experience, it all harks back to his word. And we know that he and his word, they are always consistent. And they will always give us that knowledge of him, a much deeper knowledge of him. And when he confides in us, when he, when he shares his confidences, when he shares a joke with us and let us uh, think over and uh, feel guilty and repent. It is God's work. And the Holy Spirit is the one who actually... <laughs> okay. And so, so it was that God never tried to pitch my aunt and me against one another. He never said that my auntie was right and I was wrong or that I was right and she was wrong. It doesn't have to be like that at all. And it fits in. When people say, how do you know that is God? I said, number one, I, could, I was not that kind of tolerant and accepting person. Anybody who holds a view different from mine, who does things, does it in a different style from mine, I would say, oh, you know, that, that, that person, I, I feel I don't want to uh, uh, associate with them. But God is different. God accepts everybody for who they are. So this is the kind of wisdom that James talks about, that the wisdom that comes from heaven 
is first of all pure and then peace loving. It's not who is right, who is wrong. It is considerate. It's protective of my aunt. It was also protective of my pride <laughs> and dignity to allow me to come to terms with my own intolerance. It was submissive. He does not try to push his judgment onto us. He's gentle. He allows us to come to our own views. It's full of mercy and good fruit. And it's impartial. He's not favoring my auntie or me. It's impartial, but sincere. And that is exactly the kind of wisdom that we can feel when we walk closer to God. And that is how we can distinguish between God's wisdom and earthly wisdom. Now, I said earlier on that my friend is going to show you something else. Okay, now, this little one, he's trying to show you that basically there is something here in the brain, in the, in the head, which we try from which we try to get our own wisdom, all right? Now, our head is susceptible to attacks. Our thoughts are our vulnerable parts. And there are three sources of our thoughts. One is ourselves. Oh, we didn't start the starter. <laughs> One <laughs> comes from us. The second one comes from the outside world. The third one comes from God. Okay. And so when we try to figure out a thought which comes through our mind, whether it belongs to us, to the outside world, to society, or to God, then one of the guiding principles would be this, whether the wisdom actually fits into with this, uh, with this description, that it is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. And God also gives us the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I'm just putting in one slide up here because I'm not going to go into detail about this. Um, God gives us... <laughs> I'm just showing the slide. I'm not going to talk about it. All right, so it's one and the same Spirit, and God gives us these different spiritual gifts, like a message of wisdom, message of knowledge, etc. And that is in order that we should be able to edify our community. It's not for our own good. It's not to build up our own pride to think I'm a super Christian or whatever it is, but it is in fact to enable the Christian community to work. And the fruit of the spirit, this is Sunday school stuff, so I'll flip, okay. <laughs> now, the knowledge of the enemy, we need to know this. We need to know that the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, there are some Christians who tend to think, oh, I'm not going to mess around with the devil. Then he's not going to mess around with me. Wrong. First Peter says very clearly, even if you are sitting peacefully at home in your own room, the devil will come because he's prowling around like a roaring lion and he's looking for someone to devour. And Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He steals from us our joy, our life, our health, our marriage, many things. Full armor of God, Pastor Epson has been dealing with that with, uh, at great detail. So you can listen to his online um, or, or his online uh, sermons. So I'm not going to deal with that. Uh, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, so the armor of God is not only defensive, but it is offensive. So we attack with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which comes back to the reason why it's so important that we must know the word of God. And also, actually, we have to pray for the saints. In other words, we should not only be self-focused, but we should cover one another with prayers. Now, that's very important. Victorious life. Walking with the Spirit is a life of victory. And this is the kind of life that Jesus came to give to us. He sacrificed his life for us. And when we know that we have a status as God's children, and we also know that we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he is our life coach. He will never abandon us. He's with us. And he is our strength. And then, so we are equipped to fight the enemy. So what else do we need? 
actually we have we have everything but then as i said god told me explain to them that they have to take authority because there are some christians i'm not trying to criticize I'm not being judgmental <laughs> But there are times when we tend to think, okay, I'm a peaceful Christian, I'm a good Christian, I don't go and commit sins, I don't bribe anybody, I don't tell lies. And so it's good. So I'm going to heaven and, and I'm white as snow. But no, God's heart is that we must act. And as Christians, we have to take authority because Jesus has already received all the authority in the heaven and earth and he has delegated that authority to us. So we are now the ambassadors for Christ on earth. I think somebody has turned me off. No. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, all right. Just very, very, very quickly. Um, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is, we all, have been given different gifts of the spirit, different gifts, different talents in life. And we have all different past experiences. So that is why when we go on our journey to home, to the place where our Abba Father is the king, on our route, it's going to be an individual journey. None of us is going to be like the one next to us. So we don't need to compare ourselves. It is subjective. Not everybody is called to be somebody who performs miracles or is going to be a, a miraculous healer or chasing away demons. But God has his own way. So um, I'll just show you, show you a photograph. This was what God called me during the umbrella movement, which was to, uh, in fact, I didn't volunteer. The young man there, I talked to him and he said, Auntie, will you climb up there and pray for, pray for all the protesters? And so I thought, I can't say no to that, Jesus. I can't turn it down. So I climbed up and I prayed for all the protesters, including the government in Beijing and uh, Siwala at that time. And uh, nobody, nobody stoned me. So uh, anyway, so, so the PDF we don't need to show. So what, what, what happened after that was a series of things happened. I started to get to know the young people who were protesting and I felt God called me to start writing to the newspaper. And it's not easy to get a column in South China Morning Post. You know, you can write in for letters to the editor. But they liked my writing so much that uh, China, South China Morning Post said they will pay me uh, in order to write for them. And I said, does it mean that I have to write what you want me to say? And they said, yes. I said, no, I only write what God tells me to write. So, so I didn't get that salary. But anyway, when we start doing things for God, we take one step. God will take us the future steps. We, we cannot foresee what is going to happen. But the way of walking with the Spirit is to have to wave, W-A-I-V-E, meaning to give up on our right to know the end result before we will move. Because this is the common, common requirement of people, particularly those in Hong Kong who are so pragmatic and so practical. We like to know the ending before we will take any step. But that's not God's way. God says, climb up those steps. Just go up there and pray. And that's it. All right. And, uh, and you never know what, what, what it leads to. And it led into, you know, sort of many, many further things. And it starts just like Joseph when he was in the dry well thrown there by his brothers, do you think he would actually think he would come the second in command in Egypt, the most, the, the wealthiest country of that time? We, we cannot foresee, but of course he didn't volunteer for the, for the dry well. But God gives us the free will to accept his nudgings. When we take one step, God takes the other 99. And then he propels us onward. And he always knows each one of his children, what are our real likes and dislikes? Sometimes we think that we have our desires, but uh, they're the wrong desires. But God knows our real desires because he has already wired us for that. And we need to follow, follow what he says in order to come, to come to that. All right. 
So the last thing is this, different people have different calling, and, but in this atmosphere, I want to I wanna address the generation now, because you're living in difficult times. Let's, make, let's not pretend about it. Not only the COVID, the political situation, the economic situation is very difficult, okay? And God has a word for you. He says, don't sit there. Don't act as if you are oppressed. Don't act as if you are defeated by circumstances because the world, the world is where the enemy is. Don't be defeated by the enemy. You have known that you are my child. You are equipped to fight the enemy. You know that the Holy Spirit is inside you, indwelling with you to help you, and you have amazing power. So go out, take your authority, and do what you feel I am calling you to do. It may be a small step. It may be a big step. Each one of us may be taking different ways, but some of our paths may converge. It's okay, and it's fantastic. But none of us is doing it alone because God is with us. And when we do it together, this is the beauty. Amen. This is the beauty. When one is strong, actually our community becomes stronger. And this is why we can all grow together. Now, for my little part, we have what we call a harmony in Central every Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Come join us. <laughs> we, do, we go there to worship and to praise and to proclaim God's kingdom over Hong Kong. Okay, so I think I have to end. Thank you very much. Praise be to God. Thank you. Disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that I have taught you and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you till the end of time. That is a second choice. Now that choice, as Justin explained this morning, comes at a cost. When you think about all the adventure films that you have watched, have you ever watched a movie where there are no, uh, uh, what, do, what do you say, motor you know, where, where, where everything is very smooth, the hero was successful from the beginning of the movie till the end of the movie, you wouldn't want to watch it, right? It's not exciting. It's not interesting. It's a waste. It's a waste of that ticket. It's a waste of your life. <laughs> so we know that if we want an exciting, adventurous life that God has given to each one of us, we have to be ready to become the hero of our own story. And when we are the hero of our own story, we take ownership over our lives and we say, hey, the outside external atmosphere is really lousy. I don't like it. But inside me, I have the spirit. I'm a son of God. I can think. I pray to God and ask him, God, what do you want me to do? It may just be a matter of distributing food parcels to people who are in need. Don't look down on anything of the sort. Whatever God calls us, he is giving it to you so that it will pave a way to something even bigger. There may be setbacks, but all the setbacks, when you, when you think about it, are just to make your story interesting, and you will have a good testimony to give. Okay? So, that, with that scream, I, it, it chased away what I wanted to say. <laughs> the yes, the challenges. The challenges are there to make us strong. And we trust that God will make everything which looks evil turn into a blessing. Like today, we know that the most powerful man on earth, President Trump, has got COVID. Okay? So you, you think about it. It's a challenge. Everything is a challenge. Nothing is eternal. Nothing is forever except God. And he is the one who has given to us the authority, the authority to walk the mean streets of this earth in victory with his spirit, because we're not doing it alone. We're doing it by his power, with his wisdom, and with his heart, with his love. Okay, so be blessed. Thank you. Thank you.